Duckler. I'm moderating a panel on art and spirituality uh, for the show by Myra Clark at Blackfish Gallery. Um, and I want to welcome uh, artists Don Bailey, Horatio Law, and Lauren Carrara um, to this panel. It was very exciting that we're having a panel on this subject. Um, I'm going to moderate, that is, direct some questions, but also uh, facilitate a conversation between all the artists. And uh, Myra, we need to start with you. It's your show, and uh, you wanted to convene this panel. Why don't you talk a little bit about how spirituality uh, either inspired or intersects with your current show? I just want to say first, I'm really excited also and want to thank the panelists for doing this. It's, it's really great. Spirituality is very important to me and to my work. Uh, about nine years ago, I think, I had a concussion from a bad uh, bike fall and realized at that time that my studio was really my chapel. That was my spiritual place. It was where I could recover and heal and just kind of sort things out. At that point, I became even more aware of how much spirituality is part of my work. And I, I think of spirituality as something that uh, where the self is transcended. So it, help, it it's something that I transcends myself. And I think that's what makes art powerful and beyond the individual. It provides, spirituality provides meaning and purpose. And I think it leads to ethical responsibility. And when I saw the Capitol, at the Capitol, the insurrection going on and saw the Confederate flag next to the flag that says Jesus is here, I, I thought there's a lot of confusion there about spirituality and religion. Um, I think religion doesn't, uh, religion is contained within spirituality. So I think that's, there's so many people that have spirituality but may not have a specific religious practice and it's all good. So I just wanted to say that. In this show, I, I feel very blessed by the materials. I'm just gonna hold up my Zoom. This is the best I can do, people. Hopefully you'll see the pictures on other things. But um, the materials are lend themselves to spirituality. The paper mache, which is out of tissue paper, is trans it's not transparent, but it, it becomes translucent in the light. And the pillars themselves, which are uh, made out of a hard plaster called hydrocal, those, I wanted them to be Greek pillars. And it, people have said that this space reminds them of a temple. And it was only after that I had done this that I realized that Greek pillars were used in temples and that they hold up all of the work in the show. I thought, just thought that was fascinating. So um, again, a lot of realizations about spirituality it wasn't intentional, it just happens. And I think that's a lot of what um, happened in the show. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm sure we all have questions about that, but it, when you say they were, it was sort of unintentional when you saw it in retrospect, it just reminds me that Horatio and I had a conversation in which that was also two of his installations. He saw later looking back on them, some spiritual elements. Horatio, you wanna talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, uh, I agree with, uh, Myra, totally that, uh, you know, we don't, I don't go into making a project thinking, thinking about spirituality, but uh, rather um, uh, the idea of the, um, engaging uh, the self and engaging the audience and um, the idea of just taking yourself out of it uh, is really true. Um, but uh, for me, um, uh, when I was first started making art, um, I feel really just aimless in the sense that that I can make beautiful things, but in the end, it didn't really say anything to me after I made it. Um, and then it's not until when uh, during the, um, the 80s um, and the early 90s, when I uh, was living in New York City, and um, the AIDS crisis started. I'm, I'm a gay man, and in New York City during that time is like um, a war zone in New York City where um, most of my friends uh, either HIV positive or died of uh, HIV. And um, for me, uh, I find it propelled me into thinking about what I can, uh, um, what's the reason of making art. And 
it propelled me to uh, go into graduate school to finish my study uh, because I want to really express um, the idea and the feeling and 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 the uh, um, things that we encounter during the AIDS crisis with this combination of religion and sex and death and uh, uh, mortality and all those things are open to that subject. And um, for me, that was what got me into making art because I find that uh, I was making art for a reason. I love that. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about reason and spirituality, but um, some of the things you're talking about where it's sort of a floating idea that's part of your art practice, but occasionally there's a very specific um, one that you're looking for. Maybe AIDS was like that, but I'm gonna move to Don because in our conversation, we talked about a very specific painting that he was working on for the last 10 years, um, had a fascinating name in which he felt as if I uh, maybe he was working out some of these ideas about spirituality in his art. Don, can you talk about False Prophet? Yeah, I, I, I've, uh, I started this painting about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, it's, it's, a large, it's a large piece and it's in oil. Um, it was about um, a native Paiute. Uh, his name was Vovoka. Anyway, it turned out that what he was prophesizing or thought to was, uh, of course, not true at all. You know, he, he made himself a prophet. And uh, I went to try to revisit uh, the imagery that I started with. And I was looking at it and looking at it, and I'm thinking there's got to be a better way to to communicate this with um, people so that there are images that kind of lead them into and asking, why is there a picture of a man with a hat on? And what do all of these images around him mean? Well, they are all metaphors for what this person thought he stood for or for what some native people thought he was. Um, and I didn't really approach it as a spiritual thing, but I don't, I guess I really didn't question myself before, but there definitely is a spiritual angle in, in what I do. Um, I, I think uh, it's not explicit in my paintings, but I think uh, the landscape, no matter what, no matter what it is, lends itself to notions about what Native people and culture is. Um, and so I, I kind of want to make that relevant today because it certainly is a big circle. And I find it, I find there's a much, there's a, there's a lot of spirituality in, in, in what I do. I have never really stopped to question and think about it like this though before. And, and I find it really uh, beneficial to me as a, as a native person to finally come to terms with it. I think that's uh, very common in my interviews and talking to artists that they will use that term spiritual and they will, but for everyone, it has a very different definition. I just think that's fascinating. I love that aspect of it. Now I'm, I'm going to turn to Lauren to talk a little bit about, we've had sort of specific this painting and the AIDS and, and Myra's um, sort of Greek pedestals, but there's also maybe a practice, especially Lauren's Buddhist practice that informs a lot of her work in other ways. Can Lauren, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, you know, like Dawn and Horatio, um, I never thought of my work as overtly spiritual. I always thought of my spiritual life as separate from my work. However, I wouldn't do it if it didn't have meaning for me. And um, I always think of spiritual, the outcome of spiritual infusion into my work as a sense of awe. So I work very hard, <laughs> no matter what I do, to bring a sense of awe to the viewer. And, um, you know, I much my, and what I've realized in thinking about these questions are my installations for me, more than my paintings, although now, Dawn, I'm going to rethink that. Uh, my installations are what allow me to create situations in which people will come and be transformed by awe in some respect. I mean, that's what I hope for. You know, I don't set out with that thought, but I, in halfway through, I want that to be the experience for the viewer, to, to bring some sense of um, trans 
transformation or spirit, like some spiritual transformation in the viewing of the thing. Um, and I do that by making things very large or met very many of them or repeating them. So, but you know, I, I, to answer what Don said about painting, I have this landscape that's six by nine that I've been working on for many years now and can never get it right. But I've realized it's a process piece for me that I personally am growing through doing this painting. And um, I, you know, it's, you live in the land and so I'm, I'm changing my views of the land, my experience of myself in doing the work. So it's, it's been really in process is the spiritual development also, you know, little Newtonian in the making from gold out of base metal. It's sort of a metaphor for the self to grow. And so I'm thinking in terms of that. Thank you. I love it. These uh, answers are all so, there's so many ways we could go, but I'm going to turn back to Myra because it's raising a question for me. And then all of you maybe could pitch in, chime in a little bit about what, is there an experience that you're looking for from the audience? In other words, is it a spiritual experience maybe for you or you're, you're calling on that part, but how about what, what, when someone comes to see the work, what, what are you hoping for? What do you want, if anything? Well, I, I feel like once I put the work out there, it's not mine anymore. You know, it is, but it isn't. And it's totally up to the viewer. And I can have the reasons that I did it, what I see in it, but is really what I really hope for is they'll find the reasons for what they see in it. They'll find their own associations. It will be something that that's a discovery for them. When people ask me, what do I, you know, what does it mean to me? I will say, but I really like for the viewer to say what it means to them. Because you can go around the objects in this show and enjoy them for what they are. Um, I do think people are lifted up by beauty. And I think there's a lot of beauty in this show. Um, but I also, and I think that will lift them up in some way, but I also hope it makes connections for them that they find meaning and purpose in it, um, just as I do. And it, it's probably going to be something different. And I really enjoy that. Um, I know that Don saw one of my installations and Don, I still remember your comments about it. Um, and those kind of bolster me in my own practice to know that other people have these different thoughts and feelings and associations than I do. Come on, Mary, you have to share. What were the comments? Oh, okay. Well, it was a, it was a, it was, this piece was a group of five children's chairs and there was a rock on it. And for me, it was a lot about um, how children aren't safe, how that there's violence. This was shortly after uh, the shootings um, uh, uh, where, you know, people, there had been several shootings where someone would go into school and, and shoot children. And yet I thought about where does, you know, and I thought about, I didn't want to put guns on the chairs. That was too blatant. But rocks are also, they're the first form, the first weapon in a sense, people throwing rocks at each other. So I was thinking about violence with children, but Don came in and his, in his culture, he was thinking about the rock and going back to the earth. And that was so poignant to me and so beautiful. And so he turned it, he wasn't seeing the violence in it. He was seeing the return to the earth and the whole spiritual aspect of that piece in a, in a different, acknowledging things in a different way. So Dawn, that's interesting. Um, do you often look at maybe Western art or other art and have sort of a different interpretation of it that you think maybe is, you know, not quite what the mainstream thinks? Oh, <clears throat> I think all the time. Uh, you know, I, I, I always, uh, I work from black and white archival uh, photos. And, and what I try to do is, is kind of turn that on edge and, and impose what my view is, what the photographer was trying to depict back then. And what could I superimpose now or juxtapose an image beside it to make it more modern, to make the viewer question how relevant is that then as it is now? And I guess a lot of it is spirituality uh, because uh, there's a lot of feeling about the culture, the people, not back then, but 
presently. So yeah, I, I, I think it's all relevant, um, what we do and how we look at it. And it's always- It's making me, so Horatio, let's talk about relevance. When, when you had the subject of AIDS in your art or in your installation, was, you know, that's very relevant. That, I mean, every, all art is relevant, of course, but I'm wondering about that aspect of um, something so part of the culture, but still has a spiritual aspect to you, would you say? Uh, could you repeat that question? Sure, I was wondering about the spiritual aspect of um, taking something like AIDS and bringing it sort of forward as a subject. Um, when I look at it, um, as an artist, I feel like we are a translator. Like we are um, trying to communicate to the viewer something that we understand, but very difficult to verbally explain it to people. So as artists, and especially as mixed media artists, and I, I'm sure uh, both Lauren and, and Myra, uh, we understand that we kind of give meaning to material or we look at material in a way that we sort of extract meaning and symbol out of them and, and as a way to communicate idea. And, um, and so when you're looking at a, a subject matter and then you try to find something that will uh, connect with that subject matter, uh, in, in the case of the um, uh, AIDS, I often use imagery that relating to blood. Um, and because the blood in itself is, can be life-giving, but at, the, at that time, during the AIDS crisis, I, uh, blood is considered almost like a poison or contagious and something to be avoided. And so I decided to, instead of avoid using it, I just use it and say, I'm gonna redefine the meaning. I'm gonna invest uh, meaning into this material and, and redefine it and try to translate those idea so that a viewer, that I can open the window, open the door for the viewer to come in. You know, if you just present just blood without putting it in, 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 in a context for the viewer, then it just be something red, right? But when you kind of make something and do something with it as an artist, we invest meaning into it. But at the same time, we, we try to open the door for the viewer so that they can come in and understand what we're trying to do. Uh, just a little crack and that's all you need. So uh, material for me conveyed that. It's both a, a conveyor or meaning and translator of idea, but also as a doorway for people to enter. It doesn't make sense? Oh yeah, no, I love that idea. And I, I think artists really embrace this idea of materials, obviously, and this idea is that you're look, making us look at it in a new way that I think is very important. It reminds me of Lauren's work because I want her to respond to that and very much of my show. So Lauren, can you talk a little bit about the materiality? and the yeah. well, that materiality, I think of the artist as a medium who you know can sit around the table and take these materials and sort of breathe new life into them, but really be like, to me, the artist has to get their ego out of the way and, and allow for the, the um, spirit to come through so that the materials go from the prosaic to the numinous. And I think that's in the making of the artist using their hands. Um, that things come alive. You know, I often think it's like the breath of life gets breathed into prosaic materials. And, you know, sort of an example of that is, you know, I, um, it's a long story and I won't go into it all, but I collected art as butterflies. I, I collected art as cigarette butts for a year and turned them into butterflies and hung them in the gallery. And what was really fascinating about that, they became so real that people who pushed the pins in were horrified by it and got very upset at me for killing all these butterflies. And you could see that they were cigarette butts and plastic wings. I mean, you could see if you looked at them, but they never believed it. Most people saw them as butterflies. And I thought that's the ability for art to transform 
um, basic, simple materials, butts, cigarette butts, into something really transformational. And um, I thought, okay, at what point along the way did that become something real? At what point does the blood speak to the viewer? You know, it could be red food coloring for all they know, but for them, it becomes real with all the collective and personal associations of that, you know? So for me, it's like, what makes it art is the transformation from personal unconscious to a collective unconscious. And um, I think that's what really great, great art does. You know, it has to move to the collective. Um, and I think, Dawn, to your, to your discussion about that rock, what's really interesting is in Judaism, the rock is a, is a metaphor for the self. You know, and people place rocks on top of um, gravestones. So, you know, that the way you saw that rock is fascinating, you know. Um, so that's what, that's art in that the simple object becomes a, a point of um, thought, you know, moves into a new realm, I think, you know, of, of thought. Yeah. Awesome. So, um... Myra gave a, thank you so much, Lauren. Myra gave a wonderful talk at Blackfish about the material, the materials, the very special materials in the show. And we're at the end of our time. So Myra, why don't you talk a little bit about that process, materials, spiritual symbolism, all those sort of things that are part of what's going on with this casting. And then uh, please end by telling everyone how they can come see the show. It's interesting that you mentioned casting and this is quite personal for me, but one thing I, I do is when I meditate, I try to spend some quiet time every day um, where I may take a, some text or some reading about something. And one day it was a psalm and it's uh, part of a, a anyway, it, it's a psalm and it, it, it said, cast me not away from your presence, restore your spirit within me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm having so many problems with casting. I've never done it before. It's such a pain. They just come out the way they come out, which was perfect for the show. And I thought about being cast away from, in a sense, my spiritual center or the, the spirit of what some people call the universe versus the divine. And what would that mean? You know, being a puddle of, of plaster with no shape or meaning or form. And that really um, stayed with me, that idea of meaning and purpose of the materials and how just working with materials teaches me as an artist something new about myself, something new about the art, something new about being uh, an artist and a maker. So that's an example of materials in that that really changed me. Um, and that allowing the materials to, in a sense, speak their own truth. The materials themselves inform the work. And what happens, for instance, in the cat back there, and I don't mean to go on too long, but the, the when I, or the teapot that is so fragmented and falling apart, and I had wanted to make this sophisticated thing that, em, that emulated the silver Victorian teapot I was taking it from, but no, all the cracks, all the cheesecloth that I used, all these things showing and becoming a presence and making that object really meaningful for what it is. So materials in themselves in form and for me really brought a new spiritual awareness of this show and of making these pieces. It's been such an honor to listen to all of you, to talk to all of you wonderful artists. Um, I think this is a very important topic. I hope our conversation continues. Um, Myra, tell everyone how they can come see the show and for how long and where it's at. Give us all the details. Um, the show is up at Blackfish Gallery until the 30th. The, the gallery hours um, are Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, 11 to 4. I'm available really almost any time uh, except Sundays just because I need a day of rest <laughs> the, um, to see the show and uh, just make an appointment with me. You can do that online at my website, myrawclark.com. Uh, we also have two other events. Well, there's uh, what I call virtual treats. There'll be a pairing of the show, a video of the show with the music of Hildegard von Bingen, who's a, uh, a 
mystic from the Middle Ages. It's beautiful music uh, sung by Sarah Foe, who's a Portland musician. And then our last uh, uh, virtual treat is on the last Sunday of the month, and it is um, ekphrastic poetry. So poetry that responds to art, uh, and that I'm really looking forward to that as well. So a way for people to be engaged in the show, even if you can't come down to, to see it. But I hope you'll come and see it. We only have, uh, we have a limited number of people in the gallery and masks are required, just so you know that. Awesome, I'm gonna say goodbye by invoking the very important spiritual power of names and say thank you to Myra Clark, thank you to Lauren Carrara, thank you to Don Bailey, and thank you to Horatio Law. Thank you, Mary Don Douglas. So